Good afternoon and welcome back to the Replatform podcast. Today it's just me, Paul, um, as James is away with his family on holiday, I believe. Um, and I think he's back over the next week or so. So there's a couple more um, episodes that will be just me. Um, so today I'm joined by Paul Gray from Shopify, who's going to talk us through lots of uh, new features and releases from Shopify that we've seen over the last couple of months um, that many people have asked me different questions around. So I wanted to set up an episode where we could go into a little bit more detail. Um, so Paul, thanks for joining us. Um, do you mind just giving a bit of an introduction to you and kind of your background initially? Yeah, for sure. Thanks, Paul. Hi, everyone. Yeah, I'm Paul Gray. I'm product marketing lead on Shopify's ecosystem team, um, which means a lot of my focus now is with our developer community and how we empower them to build tools, you know, apps, themes, uh, but things like storefronts as well, uh, to really help merchants in every stage of their business. Uh, I've been at Shopify for almost three years. Uh, I was running some regional marketing for a while in Canada. And before that, I was working in a merchant-facing team for Shopify Plus. Uh, working with agency partners around the world. So really trying to figure out how to best equip these partners to, again, help merchants either migrate to Shopify uh, or launch a brand on Shopify. Uh, so lots of interesting experiences. I joined just right at the time that COVID was kicking off. So that was quite <laughs> quite a change and seeing how we had to adapt quickly around that. Um, and yeah, like the world always seems to be in a state of change, uh, not just in commerce, but in everything. So it's it's always all this stuff going on. So happy to be here and chat a little bit today about commerce and trends and some products and, and things in general. Lovely. So um, so I guess there has been loads of change recently with Shopify. So, you know, additions with, you know, a massive set of new features and various updates. And then you've had the Clavio partnership and there's been lots of other stuff. Um, so maybe just initially, can you give us a bit of an overview on kind of, yeah, where the ecosystem is at the moment? Yeah. How things with Shopify are. Yeah, I think, yeah. You know, like high level, like it's an interesting time in the world. Certainly, lots of challenges. It feels like we just we're just coming out of the worst of COVID, and then a whole bunch of other things sort of blew up and changed. Um, so that's tough. And we've always tried to take a, a, a view on what what is best that can help merchants as they navigate through these things. Um, so just like when COVID first kicked off, we basically put a lot of plans on pause and worked on what products and updates can we change to help merchants at that time. So a lot of things like buy online, pick up in store, uh, really ramped up and, and you know, just building products and services that could help there. I think now one thing we wanted to do and what led to additions was get better at telling the story about all the things that we're building uh, and really focusing it on things that are relevant for merchants. So lots of changes in the world today, everything from how advertising online changes to inflation, to supply chains, to conflict, um, it's making it difficult to sort of do that classic, attract new customers and, and bring them into a funnel. Uh, obviously, that continues and we've built some products that can help there. We can talk about them like audiences. Uh, but at the same time, a lot of the focus is on how do we help brands who are really deep in the relationships with shoppers. So uh, lots of people come to store websites and, and then they might bounce or they might get into a checkout and then they leave uh, or they might buy a product one time and then they're, they're gone. So all of these are opportunities to sort of try to get that from a one-time shop to maybe a two-time shop and then maybe turn it into a multi-purchasing flow or getting people to subscribe to stuff and refer friends and family. Uh, so really, yeah, we centered additions around this theme this year of, of connect to consumer. Uh, so everything from finding the right buyers, converting them in that funnel, and then really trying to build a relationship with them uh, so that you can make the most of the, the shoppers that you already have, whether it's existing or, or new buyers. Uh, that's a lot of the focus that we've had. Right. And then, um, so I'm going to dig into some of the bigger things from the additions releases next, uh, maybe starting with marketplace kit. And initially, can you just give us uh, kind of an idea of where this is right now and kind of what the kind of core objective is for Shopify here? Yeah, I think this one's really interesting um, because I feel like it fits a lot of the trends that are happening. So something I've sort of started to say, I, you know, working in marketing, you love, you know, the four P's and all this sort of stuff, anything that starts with the same letter. And to me, there's three, there's commerce, content, and community. Uh, and I see it all the time. You know, if you look at how people are entertained, more and more it's on device, watching reels or short videos on Instagram, watching things on TikTok, getting into YouTube. Uh, it could be everything from like educational content, like how to fix a dishwasher or how to fix a bike or like how to do beauty and makeup or travel stuff. This is where people are spending time. So people are going into these kind of social communities to consume content the creators are making. Um, that's where people spend a lot of time. 
Uh, and it really creates, a, you know, where people spend time around things they enjoy is a great opportunity for creators or brands to be selling products to those people. So if it's a dishwasher repair video, it's a great place to have dishwasher repair supplies or kitchen and plumbing and stuff. And if it's a makeup video, likewise, you can be talking about brushes and lipsticks and everything else there. So this is a trend that's here really growing. Um, and I think it's looking at how do you change the nature of like, what is a store? So in the old world, you would see something and then you go to a physical store or to an online store and you experience everything there. That will continue and we're definitely doubling down on making that experience better. But what about taking commerce into those other places? So that's kind of the fundamental idea behind Marketplace Kit. So it's it's designed as a set of tools and APIs for uh, developers you know, working at, at merchants or developers building apps uh, to really build commerce into any place. Uh, so you can think of like TikTok in in some sense is is a marketplace. Like you go to TikTok, you watch the videos, you can actually buy straight from TikTok. And we work with TikTok and the Shopify integration there uh, that makes that easy. But likewise, I think there's going to be much more of this stuff coming down the line. Like I think about all these fandom communities like Wikias and you know people that are fans of Marvel movies or people that are fans of you know certain kinds of music. If they're going to these places and engaging now with Marketplace Kit, you can build commerce into that that place, uh, whether it's an existing community or or making uh, a whole new community. Um, there's one brand example that I've been looking at. It's called Avest, A-V-E-S-T-E dot co dot UK. Uh, and it was just two founders that were interested in fashion, didn't really want to build kind of their own brands. Um, it was a very much streetwear brands, but they also didn't really have the caliber or experience or capital to get into wholesale and sort of building it that way. Uh, so they used Marketplace Kit and they built their own online store. So if you look at the website, it, it's a store. Like you go there and you'll see products and they're all streetwear, clothes and, and accessories, but they don't make them. Those clothes and accessories come from other merchants. So what they're essentially doing is kind of aggregating it together around this theme, in this case, streetwear. And so they've got something like 20 or so different uh, streetwear brands uh, connected in there, uh, and they just get a 20% commission on a sale. So for the brand's point of view, it's another channel for them to reach people that are interested in uh, streetwear. And then from the Avest team's point of view, they've basically built a marketplace. So I guess they've almost built like their own kind of online department store or online sort of streetwear store uh, without ever having to do any of the, you know, the manufacturing, the branding, the building, the supply, or everything like that. So maybe it's kind of like drop shipping in a way, but but really around a very specific theme and with very specific, uh, in this case, quite local merchants. Great. And um, I guess moving on to one of the next uh, big areas, not necessarily just for additions, because there's been a few um, releases more recently, um, but social commerce. So I think the YouTube one was the most recent, um, but uh, previously, you know, you've released the TikTok checkout, the Instagram checkout, et cetera. Um, mm-hmm. So can you kind of talk us through where this is at the moment and also how big a focus is for Shopify? Yeah, I think it really sort of continues that same theme. Like it's social commerce is booming and platforms like YouTube are just massive. So many people spend such a huge amount of time looking at very high intense specific content. Uh, so we launched YouTube Shopping, um, which basically allows a Shopify merchant who has a YouTube channel to pin products next to their videos so that the followers can like, subscribe or buy those products. You know, that's it in a nutshell. Uh, so again, so if it's a... And maybe one example, I'm not, this is a merchant I spoke to a few months ago before we announced it, um, but they have a really good story. I'm curious to know if they're going to be looking into this. So they're called BK Beauty. Uh, it's a husband and wife team. Uh, the origin was in 2013, the, the woman, Lisa, was working in a corporate job, but just also enjoyed makeup and, and that sort of space. And so she started making makeup tutorials more as something to do uh, online. And she produced three videos a week for years, many, many years, and built up a community of about 200,000 subscribers. And in 2019, her husband and her decided to launch a brand because they're like, we have this huge audience, let's build a brand now. So they created BK Beauty. uh, And yeah, that was in 2019. Now it's a seven-figure GMV business with sales in 65 countries. Uh, And these are two people that were not commerce founders, like they worked in different fields. It was something more of a passion for her. But they just recognized, yeah, she has the content, she has the community, now they can add commerce in there. Um, so they they were doing it on YouTube, but I guess essentially using YouTube videos to push people back to their online store and buy from there. Uh, now, I, I'm not sure if they're doing it yet, but it would make a lot of sense then to use that capability to have the products right there in the videos. Uh, and they've also done a lot of other things like leveraging 
the ecosystem of apps out there, uh, the Paul who I spoke to really just said he, he constantly looks up and down the funnel to see where he can improve conversion. So if they're getting people to looking at products and for whatever reason he feels it's not enough for kind of like digging into it, he might tinker around with apps that, you know, position products differently or showcase reviews, or maybe there's user-generated content, which would work well for makeup, uh, to try to bump those conversion rates up. Uh, and then as it goes down the funnel, he plays around with other apps and services, are always trying to find ways to bump up conversion uh, to get those results. But it's a, that's a cool example. And I think to the question of like, will it continue? Yeah, I feel this sort of fusion of commerce content community is only going to get bigger and bigger and people spending more and more time there. Um, even in the TV space, I wouldn't be surprised with you know, it's not just Netflix. You've got basically every studio has their own online streaming service. Uh, they're building their own profiles. You're logged in. That feels like it's an opportunity to be showcasing products to people as they're watching certain types of shows and content. Um, I don't know how that will play out, but I think, yeah, we're only going to see more of this. Yeah, it's really interesting. And I guess, um, in like, and you might not necessarily be able to talk about this, so I don't know if you if you know, but so Instagram Shopping was one of the first ones that Shopify kind of released the integration with. Um, how has that kind of performed, or is that is that like um, is has that kind of been as big as Shopify expected? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I don't have any like fresh data on it, but it makes a lot of sense. And Instagram continues to refine what its product is. So I guess it, probably when that launched, it would have, it was just the posts and then maybe stories were just kind of beginning to come out. And now it's reels. And sometimes I lose track of like, what, what's the difference between a reel and a story? But I know there's different sort of formats of content and they're trying to make it more algorithmic and, and discovery based. So you can find things that you like and, and use data about the person. So it seems to make sense. So I, I think it's, I feel like we're still at that foundational stage and it's only going to get bigger. Yeah, listen, we've got a client that's doing a pretty significant amount of revenue through the checkout at the moment. Um, yeah, and like that's partly because Instagram have um, kind of incentivized users to go through the checkout. But yeah, it definitely mm -hmm. seems to be growing, particularly in the US. Mm -hmm. uh, so another another one that's been pretty widely talked about since the release, particularly uh, within the kind of D 2 C community on Twitter, um, is Shopify audiences. Um, mm -hmm. so can you just give us a bit of an overview initially on kind of what this is. In fact, initially, yeah, what what is uh, Shopify audiences? Yeah, so audiences is a new product. Um, it's a plus product in US and Canada for now, but looking to expand that. And the idea is to really help improve return on ad spend. So as everyone probably knows, in the last I guess 12 months or so, uh, Apple and, and other changes are uh, changing the nature of how online acquisition worked. Uh, so it's more important than ever to really make sure there's that return on ad spend. So the idea for audiences was to build a product that helps brands find high intent buyers and help ads perform better, um, which would ultimately lower the cost of conversion and, and acquiring customers. And then hopefully give those brands an opportunity to get more lifetime value out of out of someone. So the idea is that yeah, it's, a, it's an app and you can install it and run it directly in a Shopify admin. Uh, and really it's just like looking at the product, uh, using data that we have available to us, using data that the merchant has, and then figuring out what is the audience that might fit for that product. And yeah, auto magically, like there's a lot of calculations and, and sort of math involved in figuring it out but really honing in on the right audience that that would fit. Uh, and then having the ability for the merchant to track that. Um, there is one case study I was just kind of skimming over it before to get a bit more familiar with. It's called Bubs. Um, it's a supplement, so it's in the fitness industry. Uh, and they wanted to, you know, they'd seen lots of great growth, um, but obviously these changes were, you know, maybe going to impact that. So they implemented audiences. Um, and, yeah, the quote from from them was that it's, it's really helping them get confidence back in that top of funnel advertising uh, because they're getting qualified buyers with an ad a return on ad spend as high as three times. So that's how they position it. You can read the case study online. Uh, there's some more stats and info there, but it's really about helping them find the right audience uh, and then you know driving better conversion from there. What is Ampliance? In a word, it's freedom. The freedom to build a digital experience as limitless as your vision. Create, preview, schedule, and manage all your content in one easy place. Find out more at Ampliance.com. Ampliance. Experience freedom. Great. Yeah, we've um, we've been testing it with a client um, for a while, and I think now it's starting to get to a point where it's performing quite well. Um, mm -hmm. so it's super exciting. Do you have um, 
any idea when it's going to come to the UK in particular? I think a lot of our listeners will be very interested in that. I don't have any dates yet, um, but I would say keep a close eye on it. You know, we did a lot of work to get updates out for editions, and now the teams have been you know, continuing to work away. So lots of the things that were announced there or sort of highlighted there, they're working on expansions to those. So hopefully pretty soon. Great. And then um, probably the biggest one that was announced um, alongside editions was the B2B product, which people have been waiting for for a long time, um, particularly since the acquisition of Handshake. Um, can you give us an overview of what the current product looks like? And I think it's available from uh, October, right? Uh, yes, uh, there's like a, a staged rollout and it's a plus product. Um, and in a nutshell, the idea is, yeah, like we want to, yeah, D2C is, is one strategy and then, and then channels and then B2B is another important strategy. So building up the capabilities that we have in B2B to help merchants uh, choose to sell that way as well. Um, and the idea is to do it all in, in one shop, sort of one admin experience. Uh, so that's what we've been building. And the first five features that we've got out are really kind of, you know, the fundamentals. Like, so you, what do you need to do? Well, you need to have company accounts. So creating profiles for wholesale customers with different locations and associated buyers and people and team members, uh, things like price lists so that you can define specific pricing, offer discounts, different terms. Uh, if there's different payment terms for a certain wholesale customer, those are able to be set up. And then adapting the checkout. Uh, so that if those customers are buying, they're seeing uh, wholesale pricing and wholesale relevant information. Uh, so it's still you know, pretty early, but but a lot of stuff being built out. And I'd just keep encouraging people to to see what's coming along um, as we as we update that. Great, and I guess um, just out of interest because obviously this has been in the works for a long time and um, obviously there's a lot of competition in the B2B space how big a focus is this going to be for Shopify because obviously they have a very big kind of grasp on almost all levels of B2C retail now um, is it likely to be a, a big focus for Shopify? Yeah I think definitely um, it's one of the the key items on that we announced at Editions so it's around the theme of con- converting shoppers uh, and recognizing that wholesale customers are, are super important. Um, and maybe, you know, even more so if if the climate's an economic climate and retail landscape continues to shift. Uh, so I'd say it's, you know, equal importance and a lot of work and effort is, is going on to expand the product capabilities there. Great. Um, and then the next one that I've got written down here is Shopify functions. Um, can you just give a bit of an intro to that and kind of, yeah, how that's going to potentially benefit merchant? Yeah, for sure. So a lot of the updates from Editions, uh, if you haven't seen the page, check it out. Just look up Shopify Editions. There's uh, uh, information about products and capabilities for merchants, but then you can also click into dev mode um, and you don't have to be super techie to to read through it, but it talks about a lot of the capabilities there. So functions, um, the idea there is we want to empower developers to be able to build apps that help merchants customize discounts, shipping, and payment settings. Um, and do it in a way that is much simpler and much faster. So there's already apps and capabilities that do that. Uh, but the idea here is that the way functions works is uh, we're giving access to, uh, to, the, to the back end of Shopify that lets you define uh, how that function works. So there could be you know, intricate, complicated use cases, like if we want a merchant. So if we have a customer based here that's looking to buy this product, and we know they've bought something before. So there's a lot of like, ifs, this, 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 then we'll give them this discount. Um, also that's uh, what's being built. Um, but yeah, the idea is that it'll allow much better, much quicker, much easier capabilities uh, for things like discounting, but also shipping or payment terms. Uh, and the idea really is to just provide better shopping experiences. So when someone's on the, on the checkout and they're looking to buy, um, they can have a much more tailored or personalized experience uh, around pricing and terms and shipping and all those sorts of things. Uh, ultimately, again, to help boost that conversion and get another, hopefully, repeat buyer on board. Great. And um, another big one that lots of people are talking about that I think a lot of people are keeping a close eye on, maybe not working with yet, but definitely one for the future, is hydrogen and oxygen. And there are a few announcements around that side. Can you just give us a bit of an overview on kind of some of the updates around these two products? Yeah. So the idea here is to help merchants that want to build headless storefronts to do so um, with the world's best tools and capabilities. 
Uh, and really that's around sort of lightning fast shopping experiences that work really well, um, that are simple to update and maintain. So hydrogen, yeah, we announced last year, um, it's now general availability. There's a lot of pre-built components and templates. Uh, so anyone can go to, to our dev site and start diving into those. Uh, and it's really all the tools that are needed to build super fast, super unique uh, storefront experiences. Uh, and then Oxygen is a globally distributed hosting solution. So the idea there is when they're hosted on Oxygen, uh, again, it's just going to create a much faster, much smoother experience for people that are shopping. Um, there's two so there's two case studies worth checking out. Uh, I don't have full details with me here, but you can see them on site. So one is Allbirds, who built their site with Hydrogen. Uh, so you can dive into that. Um, I think, and the other one... Not sure of the name. Tremaine Emery. I think it's a it's a recording artist or a fashion designer who worked with a partner to build yeah a very unique, distinct uh, store that really fit his theme. So that's it was almost like trying to make it feel like a museum experience, uh, a very sort of rich site, but also fast, punchy, high converting. Uh, so check out Hydrogen. I think it's pr probably hydrogen.dev. Uh, you'd be able to dive in and look at those case studies and and get into the the technicals of, of how you might want to build that. Right, yeah, and we've been having a kind of play around that I didn't realise um, all birds are using hydrogen. That's uh, very interesting. Um, and I guess just because I'm looking at the notes and it's next on the list, um, can you maybe just give us a bit of an intro to Shopify QL as well? That's one that I was particularly interested in. I think Shopify is already pretty good for kind of extracting data just because of the APIs that are available. But yeah, it'd be good to see kind of what the plan, or bit to know what the plan is around that as well. Yeah, so Shopify QL, uh, and so with the updated editions, not only is it about how do we help merchants attract customers and convert, it's also giving merchants insights uh, and the ability to get data and, and manipulate that so that they can make the right decisions. So it's try the idea here was yeah, more commerce insight, less data science. Uh, so with Shopify QL notebooks, uh, you don't need to access a query language. Uh, you can use this. Um, and the idea is you know really access all the data from a single interface, get answers quickly with an SQL-like language, uh, combine the data in the business context to get insights. Um, so definitely worth checking out if you like nerding out in data or trying to you know, see what you can get from insights. Uh, but the idea, again, is to just provide the right kind of information. And that can then sort of fold back into the funnel. Like with that insight, learning more about who's buying, what they're buying, how they're buying it might then help with the acquisition type campaign. So, okay, now it's actually this profile looks like a highest potential profile customer, maybe we'll build an audience around that and then market to them. Uh, and yeah, to provide just continued learning as in as easy as way as possible. Great. And um, so I think that's kind of, they're the main points I wanted to kind of grill you on around addition. Mm -hmm. but, um, another change that's kind of come out of Shopify recently was there's kind of shift in how Unite is working. So historically, mm -hmm. you had one global conference once a year that was kind of aimed at agencies and developers. And then now that's been split out. And I believe the kind of structure of the event has changed a little bit. Can you just give us a bit of, um, bit of a, an overview um, on how Unite will change and kind of what their goals are for the kind of new style of event? Yeah, for sure. So yeah, obviously Unite is an event with a lot of history and, and great respect and it ran in different ways. And to your point, yeah, it was a big in-person event that would happen and people would come and there'd be talks and networking. Uh, obviously COVID kind of changed all that. Uh, so we tried to adapt during the, the toughest parts of the downtime um, and have virtual events and experiences. Um, and I think, yeah, there's there's different types of appetite for that. Like when I think about events personally, to me, events, there's two components. One is the content that you get an event, and the two is the, the networking opportunity. And a virtual event can replicate the content, but then when you think about it, it's like, well, you could just watch the content on demand. Uh, it doesn't have to be sort of at this certain time. And that networking side has always been tough. I'm sure everyone tried a few of those virtual <laughs> type things during, during the lockdown. Like, yeah, they're, they're okay. Uh, but they're not quite the same as the in-person experience. So we really, as COVID sort of looks like it's getting better, what could we do and how do we reposition? So the plan now for Unite uh, is also about trying to make it more accessible and more available in more regions. So we're running three uh, events, so three Unites. There's one in the UK and London, one in Toronto and one in Melbourne. I think they're September, October. I'm not sure the exact dates. Uh, it's much more developer-centric this time. So 
tools uh, going, especially we announced so much at additions to give developers new capabilities to build apps, themes, but also build better storefront experiences. So a lot of education around that. Um, so the highlights will be sort of recorded and they'll be made available. So you'll be able to watch those. There'll be some on-demand uh, and self-paced learning activations as well that people can do. Uh, and, hope, and we'll see how they go. I mean, it's a continued learning. Um, if they go well and there's good response, then maybe we can add more regions and scale them up um, to take that out there. Uh, but there's also other events. So anyone that's a, a partner, whether that's an agency or an affiliate expert, developer, uh, we have Shopify Partner Town Hall. It takes place every three months. The next one of those uh, is being scheduled now, probably end of September. That's a fully virtual event that you can jump into, but we have uh, live components in Discord and Slack so people can join in the conversation there. So those take place every three months. And I know our merchant teams do organize events locally as well. So depending on what the region is and so what commerce trends are going on, they might host uh, certain events, as do Shopify partners. So um, right now I'm working with uh, Yopo, one of our partners, uh, for an event in New York City, uh, which will be for merchants. So any merchant would be eligible to come along to that, uh, to our New York space. And in that case, it's going to be learning about retention and lifetime value and subscriptions and sort of referral marketing. Uh, so lots of tips and advice from from them, from merchants, from agencies, uh, and a network op networking opportunity. So yeah, definitely, hopefully more to come now that at least the COVID challenges of the world look a little bit better. Great. And I guess last question and a bit of an open one, but are there any other things that are kind of coming from Shopify beyond the events um, and potentially beyond some of the features that we've already talked about and the new features we've already talked about um, that you're particularly excited about maybe this year, early next year? Yeah. Anything else that, yeah, kind of is new that you're excited about? Yeah, I guess, I mean, so I'm working a lot with our app developer community right now, and I'm pretty excited about the changes that we've made there. Um, and what does that actually mean for merchants? Yeah, the way I look at it, it is, it's this, this is a funnel business. So it's everything from awareness, attracting audience, bringing them to your storefront, whatever that is, getting them to look and experience products, getting into a, a purchase flow, getting into checkout, and then checkout's done, then fulfillment, and the opportunity for post sales. Uh, a merchant I spoke to, and we published an article in Modern Retail. They're called uh, Thousand. They make bike helmets. They're about hundred dollars or so. So they're sort of higher end, cool looking helmets. And yeah, this is another case where the product manager at the merchant spoke to me, and he said he basically just spends every every three months. He just looks up and down that funnel to find opportunities to improve it. So he might add an app that you know, helps with address verification, or he might add an app that prompts reviews or an app that gives people the ability to quickly change an order within five minutes, just in case they've made a mistake rather than having to contact customer service. Uh, and you can see all the stats in this article. And it's, he's basically like, yeah, we did this at 30% reduction in customer service tickets. We did this when we got an extra 100K in recovered revenue. We did this, we got another 50K in this revenue. So it's just a very objective and mechanical way of going through a funnel and then being creative. So I think I'm excited about the, the app space. We've made a lot of improvements to our app store. Search is much easier. The results are much more personalized. You can see much clearer and better reviews, information about how that app works. There's case studies with, with dollar values and stats uh, as inspiration. And we've also made it easier to discover apps right in the admin and, again, make them more personalized. So the idea is, yeah, get find these right apps that can really help you bump uh, up conversion rates across that metric. So I'm excited about that. That's the area I'm working in now, but there's a huge amount of uh, work underway. Uh, all the products announced at Editions, some of them are very new, so there'll be lots of enhancements there. Uh, and I definitely encourage everyone to, to keep an eye on that page and, and stay tuned. Great. Um, thanks very much. That's all um, the questions that I had. Um, really appreciate you coming on. Some really interesting uh, topics there. And we we'll probably need to do another one of these soon with the amount of stuff that Shopify yeah. Um, but yeah, that's great. Um, and then thanks everyone for listening um, as always if you've got any questions um, feel free to shoot them over to James or I um, one last thing Paul um, if anyone did want to kind of send over any questions or contact you what's the best way for people to do that I'm, I'm a big fan of LinkedIn so you can find me on there just Paul Gray at Shopify you'll, you'll see me um, yeah happy to, to connect with people Lovely. And then as always, um, yeah, you can listen on the main podcast channels such as Shopify and Apple, and then you can watch on YouTube and feel free to give us a like. And yeah, I'll uh, see you all soon. Thanks, everyone. For more information on this topic, head over to replatform.fm for our audio podcasts. 
To discuss a project, or if you'd like to chat about any of the topics covered in this episode in more detail, please reach out to myself, James Gerd, or my co-host, Paul Rogers, via LinkedIn and Twitter. Thanks again for listening, and keep your ears peeled for the next episode.